Hello, and welcome to The Book Table, brought to you by Backroom Whispering Productions. In today's episode, we will be discussing the question, what is young adult literature? But first, let's introduce everybody who's here. I'll start with myself. My name is Medlen. I'm in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm 24 years old, and I work as a creative producer. All right, and I'm Rebecca Jones. I live in South Bend, Indiana. I am also in my mid-20s, and I work in financial aid. Woohoo! I am Aki. I live in Washington, D.C., um, also in my mid-20s, and I am a academic in training and journalist. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a little bit new this time, but my name is Sarah, and I'm calling in from Tokyo, where I work as an English teacher, part well, full-time, but kind of part-time. <laughs> <laughs> Our far-flung correspondent from Asia. <laughs> but I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia, so... Yeah. And I'm 24, by the way. <laughs> so today we are discussing, as we said, as I said before, the question of what is young adult literature or often abbreviated as YA. Um, I guess I'll just start by saying what the definition according to the all great Wikipedia is. Uh, they describe young adult fiction um, as fiction that is written, published, or marketed to adolescents and young adults. And in addition, uh, YALSA, which is the Young Adult Library Services Association, defines a young adult as someone who's between the ages of 12 and 18. So I guess that's something we can keep in mind. But I think it'd be kind of cool if maybe we could very briefly just go around to each other and try and give a very succinct, like, gut reaction answer. Like if someone asks you what you think YA is what would be your gut reaction sort of knee-jerk answer? Yeah, my knee-jerk answer um, is actually something that I had read at some point, I think, but I can't find it now, so maybe I made it up, Um, which is essentially that young adult literature features a protagonist that is a young adult. Um, And for a long time, I thought that that was pretty much the only thing that made young adult literature young adult literature, but I actually became interested in this question because I read the Lumetere Chronicles by Melina Marchetta, um, and the main characters, at least in the first one, are above 18. I mean, he's like 19, but um, still outside of the generally accepted range, um, but they're also were definitely YA novels, and so it made me think about that and then start to think about other books that were YA that focused on characters that were adult, but still were the literature was still considered YA. And so that's when I realized I had no idea what it actually was. <laughs> um, I guess uh, like what I would add to that is like, I can also think of like several books, or several series where the uh, characters are actually like children or teens, but the book is still considered adult. Like for example, right, like, that was gonna say. yeah, Game yeah. of Thrones, like, you know, or how about To Kill a Mockingbird? I think is one of the best examples of that. I mean, it's never shelved in YA, and yet it arguably probably should be. Another good one would be like The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers. I mean, those both feature young, uh, kind of adolescent teenage protagonists who, and it, uh, go through basically a building's on, but they are still shelved in adult. Yeah. But that's a I really guess, good point, Aki. Okay. I guess it's just ultimately up to the publisher, right? Mm-hmm. So this, I mean, that's what we're talking about is like how big it is. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like right. I myself, I think in trying to define YA, I never really had a strict definition in my mind. I mean, I never really thought of YA literature at all until really the year that Twilight exploded. Because then, because <laughs> before then, to get like things like <laughs> the Bartimaeus Chronicles and um, the His Dark Materials and all sorts of other series that I loved. I used to always have to go into the children's section of is, a book. Is, store. Twi- is Twilight really targeted at YA? Oh, it does. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think that, like, that, I think that <laughs> Twilight kind of defines, I mean, not really defines, but that's like what made the YA genre something that was actually on people's radar as a thing. Yeah. And it's because it was the, one of the first series that they truly marketed directly towards teenagers. Um, not even just the books. It was then especially when the films were getting ready to come out. I mean, the marketing it through MTV and really directly trying to hit the millennial audience, um, they were trying very hard to market it towards a very specific age demographic. Um, and that's sort of for me when I started trying to think about what I thought YA was. I, I never really could come up with a strict definition. And I agree with um, a writer named Elizabeth Donnelly, who's the nonfiction editor for Flavor Wire. She says YA is mostly a marketing terms 
these days. It's used right. for books that will be marketed towards teens who read. And I think that's a really good description because, I mean, I believe, I can't remember where the research comes from, but there is research that says about like 55% of people buying YA are actually adults. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet these books are very specifically marketed towards uh, teenagers, that golden like 13 to 18 year old range. Um, but then you get into huge questions like crossover fiction and really what does or doesn't apply, which, you know, I won't go into in a long ramble, but I guess for me, YA has always just sort of been a marketing thing. I'd I'd never really judged a book's content so much by it. Yeah, I I think I agree with you. I think there's no clear boundary between adult fiction and YA. And I mean, for me, having boundaries between genres doesn't make much sense. You can speak of things in like general terms, like, this is this is kind of like YA or this is kind of like sci-fi, but you really can't have a very um, like short definition because everything has elements of something else in it. Yeah, I agree, and- but I also think that there is there ha- is something that defines YA. Like there, I think there is some sort of convention of writing that makes the genre YA separate from something else. And the the reason that I feel so strongly about that is that. I recently wrote a book that features two main characters, like both of the protagonists are between 15 and 17. And I remember saying, but this is definitely not YA like this, my, and it's not even just that my intended audience is not teenagers. It just didn't feel at all like the sort of book that I would pick up from the YA literature shelf at like the library or at a bookstore or something. It just had a very different, feel to it and so I don't know and then I know that then I'll say that and someone will tell me a book that's YA that has a similar tone or something to um, what I wrote so I guess there are exceptions to everything but I feel like there is something that makes YA YA I just don't know what it is Mm -hmm. and I don't know if anybody else feels that way. Going off of that though I was thinking recently that I feel like the YA as I experienced it when I actually was a young adult and YA as it is now when a lot of my relatives like cousins are young adults, I feel like it's getting a lot darker. And I don't know if that's just because like dystopian stories have been popular recently or I don't know. But the books that they recommend to me, like my cousins, they're like 12, 13 years old are books that I definitely would not have read at that age. Like I would not have read Hunger Games at that age, for example. So I I wonder if it's changing a little bit, like, or if that's just like my chance, or I don't know, but I can agree with you, and I definitely see there's a shift towards darker storylines and um, such in YA. And I remember th- this reminds me of something that I I took a film genres class, and we talked about the way genres develop over time, and it's almost like it's a reflection of the mores of the time that you're in. So in this case, it's that we are kind of in an age where there are lots of really dark stuff going on. So the things that are affecting these young adults or these teenagers, it tends to get reflected in the literature, obviously often blown to hyperbolic proportions. I mean, we don't have a hunger games going on. (laughs) I hope not. Um, In which case I do not volunteer as tribute. Um, And uh, (laughs) there's definitely a shift towards the darker, but even then, I think it's also part of, again, that that idea of the YA market wasn't so defined. I mean, I think of something like His Dark Materials, which is arguably a, a quintessential uh, piece of crossover because it's, it's. I mean, from having worked in a bookstore, it's shelved in children's, it's shelved in young adult, and it's shelved in adult science fiction fantasy. Right. You'll find it in all three locations. And those are pretty dark books. And That's I true. was reading that at the age of 9 and 10. Um, yeah, we were young. <laughs> yeah, and even arguably Harry Potter becomes the poster child for starting as something that's middle grade that shifts into young adult by about book four. Harry Potter scared me when I read it the first time. Like, I remember reading the scene at the end of the first book with Fluffy, like the giant dog. <laughs> I had to put it down. I was so scared. I was like 10 years old. I can't talk about Yeah, we were like 10 book. or 11. <laughs> it was very scary. Chamber of Secrets was horrifying. Yeah, and then think of when we were 10, um, book four came out, and there's that horrific sequence in the graveyard with the resurrection, yeah. part, which is genuinely, when you strip away the magic, it is an adult male telling a 14-year-old kid, I am going to murder you. I mean, it, that is dark. <laughs> That's, and, yeah, it's 
terrifying. Yeah, I mean, there's murder and who knows what and everything else that goes on. And yet we don't really think about it, I think, in that respect, because it's fantasy. So we suspend but, our belief so many times. I, I think that's the thing about YA, though. Right? We, because we're adults now, we can see it and like think of it that way. But why is purposely packaged the way it's written? So, uh, like, a kid reading, like, Harry Potter won't have to confront the fact that, like, Voldemort is telling Harry that he's going to, like, murder him or whatever. Like, I think, um, going back to, like, what Rebecca was saying before, like, if there is something about YA that makes it distinct, I think it's just the way, um, it's a stylistic thing. Like, somehow it's, like, written in a way that makes you feel better about things. That's yeah, so a- actually, Aki, I wanted to bring this up because I know last uh, month in our discussion about an ember in the ashes, I don't know if we talked about it in the podcast, but in our discussions before the podcast, you had definitely mentioned that you were confused that an ember in the ashes was considered YA because of like the violence and the stuff that mm. happened in it. Or someone said that. Or we had a huge discussion on it. I do remember yeah. that. And I think, I know I'd said that I actually didn't find it that dark. And I think I, it's just like Sarah said that it, things are getting much darker in YA. Like on reflection, it wasn't too dark. Like both because of the, her style of writing, which wasn't too deep. And also, um, like she just threw out like really dark things in a casual way that kind of made you not feel like they were dark. Like she just talked about rape like every like other page. And, yeah. And there was no consequence like, to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and so that's what I'm wondering because I had I know I had made a comment at some point in the discussion about how I was getting annoyed with that sort of trope in YA books that I was reading where it was like all of this gratuitous violence and sexual violence and whatever but that it wasn't actually like it had no impact the way it was included in these stories and I had run across that before I read An Ember in the Ashes and like five of the YA fantasy books that I had read previous to that. And so I wonder if that's like sort of a trend in the genre or something. But to me, that <laughs> screams YA at me. Like I wouldn't expect to run into that in an adult fantasy novel. I would expect to run into violence or sexual violence, but in a very different way where it's dealt with differently and has much more impact. I it's know. not just like scary thing that might happen. Oh no. Yeah. Like, I, I think maybe it's because I also read a lot of things that aren't fantasy. I then think of what are, uh, I don't think it counts as the teen problem novel, but you have things like speak by Lori Hall Sanderson. And that's all about a girl who gets date raped and it's the aftermath of all of that. And there are very genuine consequences. I mean, this girl becomes a selective mute for like a year and she's basically got PTSD. So it, it can be dealt with. I think it's a sign of a poor writer that it gets dealt with flippantly. Um, right. And that it, it, I do agree that it is a problem I see. And it is something I do see in YA more frequently than not. And I, and I wonder if it's also the issue of um, that some writers or publishers and marketers are sometimes afraid of how far they can push their boundaries because they know it's being marketed to teenagers. Um, now, I personally think that's kind of crap. And I agree with the great, author Sherman Alexie, whose book, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, I read actually in college as part of an American Indian lit course, and who is currently the number one most banned book of uh, in schools in the U.S. of the year. Props to him, because it's a phenomenal Seriously? book. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. It's a phenomenal book. What's it book. about? I've never read it. It's about a boy who's half American Indian, half white, and he grows up on an Indian reservation, which is basically the third world in the U.S. I mean, yeah, they are they're so terrible. So much poverty it's there. So bad. Um, and it's all about him growing up and dealing with life. And it got banned for things like, you know, I mean, he's a teenage boy. I mean, sexual thoughts, um, for alcoholism, for like, uh, language and all sorts of things. Um, it's really a phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. It's a book that's always struck me, but Sherman Alexie wrote a really great article when, um, Absolutely True Diary was first getting kind of banned and, um, came on pushback and the article was called Why the Best Kids Books Are Written in Blood. And what he talked about, he says, when you write um, these books, it's like, one, you really shouldn't sugarcoat it. You shouldn't water it down. He goes, the really good YA books that are really aimed at teenagers are the ones that deal very frankly and very honestly with them. Teenagers are not stupid. 
Yeah, and so, they can, and I think Philip Pullman has stated, he goes, kids know and teenagers know immediately when you're being condescending to them. They know when they're being talked down to. So I think right. some of the, the issues with YA is that it's not necessarily, I think, the writers want to talk down to them or want to sugarcoat things, but I think it's actually more of a publisher marketing thing mm-hmm. that they're worried about how far they can go. But worried about backlash, I guess, from adults more than... Yeah, it, it, it kind of baffles me. I'm like, if you think that burying your head in the sand and telling these kids, no, it won't happen to you, means that it just goes away. It, it, it's, it's such BS. Uh, it's like, sorry, terrible things happen all the time. I'm like, look... I'll speak from personal experience. I was groped horribly on the tram, uh, on the uh, tube when I was in London. I was like, I know people who've been victims of sexual assault and stalking and things like that. I'm like, it doesn't go away just because you don't want them to read about it. It's like, it happens to anyone at any time. Deal with it honestly. And I think that's really all we should be asking from YA Lit. In terms of writing style with YA Lit, I always notice that the writing usually seems to be a lot more fast paced in YA Lit. That's true too. Have they been getting longer or have they been getting more, like, sequels? Both. <laughs> Both? I don't, okay. I don't know that the books are necessarily getting that much longer. I just know from, like, the author side of it um, that word count has stayed the same. Yeah. Uh, at least, like, word count expectations, which, to be fair, for, like, a young adult fantasy book still gives you, like, a 30,000 word count gap. So now we're maybe getting closer to the people who are writing 100,000 word young adult books versus 70,000. Yeah. Um, but theoretically the boundaries are still the same. Yeah. I think they tend to get longer if it's an author who is writing in a series. So like Sarah J Mass and the throne of glass series, those books have gotten absurdly longer, like ridiculously longer with each book, but she's like the Harry Potter too, even like this is, yeah. Yeah. Harry Potter. Um, Yeah, the kids have no problem picking up a book that's over 800 pages and tearing through it. You know, it's like, they'll do it if they're invested. Yeah, but it's, yeah, I know. It's like, it has to be a later book in a series. You can't have, like, the intro book be that long. Yeah, Um, unless you're doing something, like, really clever. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's rare even in adult fiction, I think, for books like that to come out. Like, right now, there's a book coming out on Tuesday called City on Fire, and it's literally, like, a 1,000-page debut novel. And everybody's like, yeah, I'm not even kidding. People are, like, wigged out by it because that never happens, not even in adult fiction. Um, fantasy, I think, tends to be a little different because, because it's considered genre fiction. Lots of air quotes here. Genre fiction. Um, because it's sort of <laughs> like its own little subset. It's expected to have oftentimes these longer novels. Um, which, you know, that's good or bad, depending on the writer and the story. Yeah. I was thinking, this is a little bit unrelated, but late, now or later on, can we talk about YA books that started out as YA but crossed over into a broader audience? Oh, I think that would be interesting yeah cross for example like, like when we were talking about harry potter that made me think about it because like it started out as like, a kid's book right the audience was like it right. was a children's yeah. book i think or at least close to it because most of us when we read it were probably like 10 or 11 when i was 10 years old it was read to a whole class of 10 year olds that was like right audience. yeah i think yeah. and then gave me by the time the last book came out i remember i was fighting with my mom over who got to read it first <laughs> Yeah, so like, yeah. oh, I'm not even joking. Like, yeah. So. No, yeah. When I got the last book, I got it at midnight, and then I read it until I fell asleep and I hadn't finished. And my dad apparently had come into my room to take it and realized I wasn't done. It was so angry at me because he's like, "You need to finish because I need to know." And I was just <laughs> like, "Well, I have 200 pages left. Get off me. I need to read." I love hearing these stories of people who shared Harry Potter books in their family. Because we did, like, we were psycho, and so we definitely all would go to the midnight releases, and we all got our own books, because there was no way we were sharing. That's amazing. I'm so jolly. (laughs) Like, my dad never really reads fantasy, although my dad, he kind of reads everything. He tends to read a lot of thrillers, but he always goes, as he says, like, if it's a good story, he doesn't really care what genre it's in. But I, it took me four years of nagging to get him to finally read Harry Potter. And when he did, he was addicted. He's the second biggest Potter head in the house. I'm obviously the first one, but like he's the number two. (laughs) My family was weirdly opposite. Like my dad is really into Lord of the Rings, like ridiculously into it. And he's, I don't, I wouldn't say he's really a big fantasy reader besides that, but like 
I expected that he would have been more likely to pick it up, I guess, or to listen to me when I said to read it. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't into it until years after it finished. He read them all in a row. And his biggest complaint was, like, the beginning of every book, they summarized the last book. I'm like, well, yeah, because there was, like, years between them. So, <laughs> it's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> there was no binge reading going on when they were coming out. <laughs> but, I don't know. So, I guess that's not really a good example because it's so widely popular in general. But, like, I feel like recently there have been a lot of YA books picked up as movies. That Definitely. I don't think that was really a thing before. And so, I would have to wonder when that started. If it started Twilight, with Twilight, 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 Twilight. It was Twilight. It was genuinely Twilight, and I can tell you why. Because Harry Potter, when it first came out, was actually a gamble for the studio. Um, because as much as the books were really popular, I mean, only the first three had come out. And maybe even then, when they were getting ready to go into development, it was maybe only the first two were out. Um, fantasy as a genre in film was not selling. Um, so for them to go and make Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or in the Sorcerer's Stone was a big risk. And it was basically a little British independent film for most of its conception. But the idea of the, the YA movie machine, that was Twilight. Twilight invented that because they, again, did that whole thing with marketing through MTV. I mean, I remember waiting. I never turned on MTV except for, I mean, when they were getting ready to pump Twilight and with all the marketing they did. Um, and from that, you can then thank Twilight for things like the Hunger Games machine and the yeah. Maze Runner and everything else that's been happening. I think Full Moon Stars is kind of its own thing, but whatever. Twilight, Twilight totally opened the door, but I do think the Hunger Games made it a machine. Mm. And it was, but it was because then the Hunger Games movie started coming out when dystopian YA teen novels became like the thing. And even where it was like every book that you were reading was a young adult dystopian novel. I know. Um, and they have had, there have been so many movies that have come out. Most of them are total flops. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and, and somehow they're flops and they still get sequels. <laughs> Looking at some you, of them are like, okay, like I can't even talk about the Divergent movies right now. Um, <laughs> I read those books. So I haven't seen the movies though. The movies are awful. I mean, it, was, it's god awful cinema. Like I can't I even talk about it. Insurgent was apparently in theaters and I didn't hear about it and I don't know if that was willful on my part or like what but I think they actually make a lot of money I don't know how I don't know who's seeing them but whatever I think probably just like, like, they, like my cousin's age who like really into it she's she's so into that series I read it because she's like my third year cousin so she was like she had yeah. this t-shirt she's like you have to read this it's so good yeah, I, I was think like, a right. lot of like younger teens have really enjoyed Divergent, yeah. and a lot of older ones who I've talked to have been sort of like, eh, no, we'll just read Hunger Games. So I'm like, fun fact, <laughs> fun fact, do you know how Hunger Games got its first serious word of mouth press? It was from Stephanie Meyer. She oh, pumped, really? she pumped it so hard on her blog, and, and at that time, the Twihards were strong. They all went to read it. <laughs> and I kid you not. I kid funny. you not. I'm like, you can thank Twilight for the Hunger Games. <laughs> I'm like, so many things we hate thanking Stephanie Meyer for, but we do. <laughs> yeah, but that's a whole, yeah. And that, I think, also came with the rise of, like, the blogging culture. I mean, YA recently has seriously exploded in the wake of BookTube, which has now become a very serious thing that publishers look to um, when they want to pump the new YA books. Um, yeah, is BookTube exactly? I have no idea. Okay, BookTube is like that little sect of YouTube where people basically do video book reviews or do like showing you what books they've collected um, and all sorts of stuff. And predominantly it is done by young adults and a lot of them are reading predominantly young adult literature. A oh, okay. lot of the books that I have read in the YA I have found through watching people's reviews on um, BookTube. Um and so I'm like, well, it's clearly doing its job because it has sold me several series. <laughs> Probably because the biggest audience on social media is going to be the age range that YA appeals to mm -hmm. mostly versus when you think about young, or, um, sorry, not young adult, adult fantasy fiction. Um, sure, there are plenty of people on social media who are interested in it, but you can expect that like almost anybody who's reading YA is also going to be pretty active on social media. Yeah. And and I think the one rare exception in the adult fantasy is Brandon Sanderson. He's literally like, if you watch booktube, the people who are reading fantasy on booktube, YA fantasy predominantly 
they love Brandon Sanderson. He's like the king of booktube. Everybody has read the Mistborn trilogy and they all love it. In fact, um, three of the biggest booktubers that are on there right now, which would be Poland Bananas Books, Caddy Tastic, and Jesse the Reader, they have a book club that they do each month called Book Explosion. And for one of the months, they read Mistborn. And they were all just like, holy crow, you know, Brandon Sanderson, like this, Brandon Sanderson, that. And he, he's like, okay, he can do no wrong on BookTube. They, Miss, they, Miss Bourne does have sort of a YA feel. Yeah, yeah. I kind of was going to say the same thing. It, it actually got re-released with new covers and put into the YA section. And they're, they're, <laughs> they're ugly covers. Like, I'm sorry, if you're going to buy Brandon Sanderson books, buy the UK editions. They are so beautiful. Oh, my God. Just, just I really wish that I had done some research into it before we started talking, but... When you said that, it reminded me that when I was reading Mistborn, I think I was talking to Key and Shelley online somewhere, and we were laughing about, like, the Japanese covers of the books, because they're all, like, really, like, mongy. <laughs> uh-huh. And even, like, Game of Thrones, it comes out, I have the first two in Japanese, and or it's the first one, it's split into two books. Yeah, they do that in the UK, too. Like, they they have these, like, cartoony covers that are really childish-looking to me. Huh. And so I, I really wonder, like, who exactly it's marketed to but i should have looked into it before we started talking i didn't think about it at all yeah like i wonder if it's different in different countries i guess is what i'm saying mm-hmm. the game of thrones are honestly yeah. hilarious like if you have time go look on them on amazon.jp they're so funny oh like, gosh now I'm, <laughs> I'm like so curious now because i have a thing about books and their covers because i now so rarely buy physical books that i i get them more for like collecting purposes a lot of the mm-hmm. time too so I'm like i want that thing to look good on my shelf if it doesn't no, look I mean, like, good they don't look bad but like it's each one has a different because like they're all split in half right so there's like yeah 10 or more of them and each one has a different character on the front so like the first one has danny and, and the john and the only reason i knew it was john was because it had like this white wolf and i was like oh my god like because <laughs> he's like this like skinny like like just like anime main character. No, that is so funny. Oh, no. I'm sorry, I'm looking at them on Amazon right now. Oh god, that's this is so completely unrelated, so I don't want to get too off track. But like, yeah, oh, but that's bad. That, that kind of like brings me to a point though. Like speaking of Japan, like I feel like uh, if you think about it, most like manga and anime would probably fit in the YA category because oh, absolutely. The, yeah, that's a good point. All the protagonists are like teenagers like i i wonder if like japanese people associate fiction with like teens. as far as i'm aware like because i teach teenagers or i teach like 16 year olds and it's definitely popular like all the popular series like they're all really into but adults read it too i know a lot of adults like, mm-hmm. like you walk look on the train there's like people sitting around like 40 year old salarymen sitting around with like a manga in their hand so but a lot of it's like porn but anyway like <laughs> i think like, for example like one piece is like definitely like a main character is like a, a teenager or whatever and I, to, honestly i haven't read it but it's wildly popular here among adults teenagers everybody so i'm I, yeah i guess it's ya but yeah no that it doesn't have the same kind of classification yeah I, it I is. feel like in a lot of cultures though like maybe not in western cultures but definitely in like many other cultures, um, like in Asia or like the Middle East, like reading fiction is associated with, with being childish. So almost by definition, everything there would be YA because mm-hmm. by an adult just doesn't read fiction. You yeah, know you could I mean? even think of uh, like Jane Austen she, in her book Northanger Abbey. She talks about her main character, Catherine Moreland, as being described as being very young because she likes to read the novels, um, particularly the ridiculous gothic romances. But um, novels, nonetheless, there was that association that reading fiction was a either like feminine thing or a very like a younger mentality kind of thing. And, you know, I, I kind of think of my family and I think that that's sort of right. Like I tend to read the most fiction out of everybody. Like my parents and my grandparents are more likely to gravitate towards nonfiction yeah. than I am. Like, I mean, I'll pick and choose some nonfiction, like, I, I'm, I'm pretty pick and choosy about it though because I prefer to be told a story than to read something very dry. Okay, but you can be told a back... story like through history. Yeah, it depends on the writing. I'm very picky about it. This brings me back though to actually I had I had a conversation with Mad about this um, on my like first day of work. Um, I was talking to someone about how like what I liked to read and that I was a writer and that I read primarily fantasy and I write fantasy. And she literally said to me, 
you don't look like somebody who reads fantasy. And I just like, <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. I was just like, for the longest time was sitting there chewing on that. Like, what does that even mean? And well, now that we're read. having this conversation, I feel like there is sort of something to be fair. This woman is a she was in her like mid forties. Um, and I think that there might be a generational thing where fantasy is concerned. It's certainly becoming more broadly accepted but the sort of idea of things that are like super imaginative, um, different worlds, whatever is geared towards like children or younger people. And the older, if you're older and you're reading fantasy, then that means that you're like sort of a nerd or like whatever. And I don't know that that's necessarily true anymore, but I think it was. And I'm sitting here like looking at my movie shelf. Actually, I have a children's movies on the top, which is mostly Disney and Studio Ghibli. Heck yeah. And and I'm thinking about Studio Ghibli specifically because most of those stories are like not children's stories <laughs> at all. No. But they're considered, but they're considered children's movies because it's like this animated fantasy and that's what makes it for children. And they're I know that there's children's topic- movies in the U.S. I think more than here, but I'm yeah, not entirely really sure about that. Yeah, I can agree with that because I think of, I mean, even just on the topic of studio, um, uh, is it Ghibli or Ghibli? It's Ghibli. Is it Ghibli? Okay, that's oh. what I always thought. Somebody told me I was wrong and I was like, uh, no. No, it's Ghibli. Right. It's, yeah. Okay, so Studio it's Ghibli. Ghibli G, I guess. I mean, yeah. yeah. But with Studio Ghibli, I mean, I remember I had to, I had to try really hard to get my parents to watch any of those. I mean, they look at, animated films and cartoons is just that cartoons they think they're kind of for kids and my parents usually aren't that snobby but they were kind of like uh i don't know but i remember showing them spirited away and both my parents were like transfixed by that movie and they just went that was not necessarily a children's film they're like it's definitely good for children but adults get a lot out of that film too and i was just like i think it's a I think it's a marketing thing too because Disney oh, films are marketed through Disney in America. Yep, that's true. And they so, are. yeah, and so I think I think it's a marketing thing, and I think it's if they weren't marketed through Disney, then maybe they would have a better chance of being seen as something more. But yeah, I mean, only one that has yeah, shot in was Japan really are they. In Japan, are they more just like broadly like this is a film that's coming out as opposed to this is a family film that's coming out when a studio Ghibli, Ghibli film is coming out, Sarah? Um, I'm not entirely sure about it because I don't watch that much TV, but it's just like when it's in the theater, it's just in the theater. Um, okay. But the thing is, the theater here is kind of weird because they don't like to have competing movies in the theater at the same time. So if, I don't, I think, for example, like they wouldn't release like for example, Frozen at the same time as a new Ghibli movie because they wouldn't want competing audiences. And that's why we get a lot of action films late because they don't want action films competing with each other in the theater so they can get more of a profit. It's kind of confusing. But so because of that, in one sense, yes, because the films that we'd be competing with would be like Disney films, for example. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think it's just kind of its own thing. It's just kind of really famous and popular. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, again, what you were saying about it being done through Disney, like when Mononoke was being distributed through the U.S., it was being done through Miramax, which at the time... Oh, was it really? I didn't know that. Yeah, it was, and they handled the dub, actually, because that's one of the two Miyazaki movies that's rated PG-13 in the United States. And um it, it was done because through... Because of the blood. Yeah, the only other one I know, I think, is The Wind Rises was rated PG-13. And that also, I mean, I didn't see that promoted, like, at all. It was by chance a friend mentioned it to me that it, the dub, which had just come out, was playing in a theater near me. So I was yeah. like... Oh, I think uh, the past, like, three or four haven't really been promoted in the U.S. No, which is really kind of saddening. I thought The Wind Rises was phenomenal. It had me, like, sobbing like a baby by the end of it. I, I mean, I was a puddle in the theater. And myself and my friend were the only two people in that theater. So I didn't care. Um, I, um, <laughs> like two years ago, right? I, I, I don't know how I felt about that movie. I thought the ending was, like, like really rushed. If you, have you ever seen the um, the documentary, like, in, like, Dreams of, uh, like, Gods and Madness? It's something in, or something like that? Yeah, it's all about him making that film. Yeah, it's on Netflix. It's all about Miyazaki making that film. So it's really all about Miyazaki. And it's interesting. He changed the ending like two or three times because he never actually writes a script 
he yeah. storyboards while they're making the film, which I swear to God, I don't know how anybody does that. But I, I, mean, I know but that's I, what makes him such a freaking genius. I know he is. Nobody should be able to function like that. I also firmly think he has some form of like bipolar. Um, I, he talks about depression a lot. But I'm like, yeah, your movies make a lot more sense now. <laughs> like, there's elements of them. But The Wind Rises, I think I appreciate that film as a creative where I'm watching someone who is cr- who just wants to create but unfortunately has to do it for reasons he doesn't like. And so I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Should we go back to books? <laughs> yeah, 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 we should. Um, what I'm curious about coming out on the other end of this is we've talked about some cool stuff, but do people still think that YA is just a marketing strategy or do we think we can define it? I think I'm the only one that gave a definition. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so we, we does anybody that. else want to <laughs> offer up a potential definition or argue that there is no definition because it doesn't exist? That's a That's a legit argument. If someone wants to try to make it, I might argue with you, but... Yeah. I mean, have you ever heard of the uh, saying, you know it when you see it? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's kind the of like thing, that, right? The thing is, though, like, I didn't go through all of the um, articles that Matt, that you sent before, but I know a lot of them were talking about, like, books that were originally meant to be or tried to be published as adult books, but then were only bought up by publishers that would publish it as YA. And so I think, I don't know if it's necessarily you know it as you see see it all the time because sometimes it's like this was sold as YA and so I see why it was but if it wasn't maybe I wouldn't have thought of it that way you know what I mean mm-hmm. so I mean I can't think of it but maybe way. those are the outliers maybe it's the ones that were supposed to be sold as adult that then ended up getting sold as YA that are the ones that make us think wait but is there actually a definition for YA yeah I mean, that's true like one of the Prince Honor books from a couple of years ago it was by Suzanne Kokel, and for the life of me, I can't remember the title. Oh, it was called The Kingdom of Little Wounds. It was like a Prince Honor book. It it didn't win, but, I mean, that book, I swear to every god that ever existed, you could put that in adult and nobody would know. I mean, by the way, talking about something that deals with sexual violence and doesn't hold any punches, that's a fantasy book that doesn't. Holy crow. Um, Because literally, I think every... Every character has, like, syphilis or something by the end of the book. God, oh, my God. I'm not even kidding. It is a disturbing as all get out book, which really deals with violence against women in, like, this, like, Swedish kind of Nordic kingdom. But whatever. You could put that book in adult. Nobody would know. Nobody would know. Like, th- How old was the main character in that book? The characters were all actually age ranges, late teens to, like, I swear, like, the fo- their 40s? I mean, a lot of them were adults. Yeah, I think that that goes back to what Rebecca said then, that, like, maybe, <clears throat> I don't want to say real, real with air quotes. Yeah. YA <laughs> is, like, when the characters are young adults, and then, I guess, you have your, like, outliers, like mm-hmm. that. Because, like, I think that was a really good definition, because when I think about it, that that is my image of YA, actually. Yeah, and I think, see, I think that in my understanding of YA, it's important to me that not just the protagonist, but that, like, most of the characters Mm, are in their teens, and that there's sort of this understanding of a difference between the teens and the adults, and often there's, like, this sort of struggle, and there's something about the teenage experience, whatever that is, because it's different for everybody, but... There are a lot of fantasy books that are adult fantasy books that have teenage characters or like teenage main characters, but mm-hmm. they aren't, they don't act like teens. They aren't like teens. Yeah, that's it's the more, key, it's more, this is the age of a person. And if we assume that fantasy is largely based on sort of like medieval type standards, then when you're 14, you're an adult and that's when things happen and you can go out and make a life for yourself. So that's why I think like, Juliet Marlier, um, who is one of my favorite authors ever, um, she writes fantasy and almost all of her main characters, her protagonists are like 15 and 16. Sometimes they're 17. But when they're 17, it seems like they're so old when you're reading it mm-hmm. because it's set in these worlds that are like, you know, when you're a teenager, you are an adult. And so that makes it not YA at all because then it doesn't seem like it's at all about being a young adult, it's just that's the age 
of they adulthood in this world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just like the Queen of the Tearling series. Uh, Red Rising by Pierce Brown does that. And uh, another really good one is The Bowen Season by Samantha Shannon. They all have characters who are in their mid to late teens, but you don't really think of them as teenagers. They feel like adults. They speak and act like adults because this world that they're in demands of them to be adults. And they don't really have that quote unquote young adult teen experience. So. Yeah, and actually, so the Queen of the Tearling, I know, Mad, that you have read the Queen of the Tearling and Invasion mm-hmm. of the Tearling. I don't know how many other people have, but that's a classic one where I have seen that both in on like YA shelves and on adult shelves. And um, I see some sort of what I would consider characteristics of the YA genre in those books. Like there's a little bit of that mm-hmm. distance I feel that exists between here's the actual impact of what this would be um, versus we're going to talk about this sort of violent thing. And then, but then it's also not YA at all. And there are certain things that are really like poignant and have a lot of impact. And then the character, like you said, you know, she is young, but it's more like she's an adult Mm -hmm. and everything that's happening. Everyone's an adult and everything's happening in an adult world. Um, yeah, And so I, I, that's another one that kind of confuses me because then it's like, are we just marketing it as YA because... Oh, definitely. Because we, I want, don't even... we want a wider readership. We want more people to read it. Or what... So is there a conflict between what YA actually is and then how it's being marketed or what? I would say yes, <laughs> definitely. I know, especially with that series and something like... Like the other two that I mentioned, Red Rising and The Bone Season, I mean, those, um, I've, when I worked in a Barnes & Noble, were shelved in adult. And actually, Bone Season wasn't even shelved in science fiction fantasy. It was just shelved in literature. Um, and it's very much a kind of science fiction fantasy paranormal dystopian. It doesn't really know what it is. It's kind of everything and nothing at the same time. Um, <laughs> it's really good if you ever read it, but it is kind of, and it'll make you feel bad because the author published that at the age of, like, 22. And I was just like, oh. God, I feel so underaccomplished. Um, but um, those are books which are shelved in adult, at least in the bookstore that I worked in, in any of our Barnes & Noble. They've been shelved in adult. But they frequently get called YA. And I'm like, a couple of them have some of those elements of YA. But I don't think I could call them YA. And especially, like you said, with Queen and Invasion of the Tearling, especially by Invasion of the Tearling, when they split off to introduce their brand new perspective character, that is, that is not YA. Yeah, it's that's not basically, YA at all. A, yeah, that's, that's adult fiction all the way. Um, it's interesting to see where the marketing and the, um, I think actual intent and in writing of the author as at least I as a reader perceive it diverge um though i've never really s- yeah, i think it's interesting that you've seen those marketed as ya i don't think i ever have i mean i remember i heard about them through like emma watson's twitter that was how i became aware of that and the great article that erica johansson wrote on why we need ugly heroines but other than that i don't think i've ever seen those marketed as YA. though i could see why they might be I was just going to say, I had never seen them marketed that way, but I had seen them on, like, my library has them in the YA section. Oh, okay. Um, and then I, when I actually bought Queen of the Tearling, I couldn't find it in the adult section. I found it in the YA, but Invasion, I could only find in the adult, so. <laughs> <Whatever. Confused. laughs> but sorry, Sarah, gonna, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, um, while you were talking, I was thinking about something entirely unrelated, so I'm really sorry. But, no, that's fine, go. Uh, one of the things that the document that you had us read brought up was that a lot of YA authors seem to be women. Yes. And I I was thinking about it too. And a lot of YA books, like we've been talking a lot about fantasy, but when I think about the books that are in the YA section, if I walk over there, a lot of them are also like teen high school stories about teenage girls Mm -hmm. marketed Mm -hmm. towards like love stories or just like general high school stories, whatever. But like, I have to wonder if YA, if like they think that more readers are female, like more young readers are female, and so that's why that happens. Or I'm not sure exactly the reason, but I thought it was something yeah. we should talk about. No, that's totally interesting. You're totally right. I think 
I, there's probably been research done to find the exact statistics of that. Um, I definitely know what you're talking about, like the young adult, what's called the contemporary. And like there is a whole young adult romance section, really, in most bookstores. And those are used to be all the like paranormal romances. But now are pretty much just romance in general. But I would say probably more than 50 percent of YA is marketed at females. Um, so much of it is. Oh, my goodness. Um that that is really interesting. Like, I, I want to know where all the statistics on that came from. And I, and I wonder if, again, that's still part in relation to when Twilight exploded, because that readership yeah. is predominantly female. And if you're- I don't think so, though, because I think like I'm thinking about like when before Twilight, like when I was like 13, 14 years old mm-hmm. and like just like I mean, it could be wrong. It could just be those are the books I picked up. And that's why I'm remembering it this way. But my image of that section of the bookstore is that it's like very female heavy in the characters, in the authors, in this like kind of target audience. But yeah, I don't know. Aki, no. Aki, you're the only you're the only man here. Do you have a different like memory <laughs> about that? Like if you if you okay, your memory of like when you walked to the YA section when you were like 13, 14 years old, what was like your image of that section? Like what were most of the books that you found? Were they mostly like fantasy or? Well, I feel like I have. Like a different experience than you guys, so I don't know if it would be. I, I, I remember, like, I, so I think the four of you predominantly read much more fiction than nonfiction, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Right? Like, that, with that, like, I think I have always read more nonfiction than fiction, and I think that's true of most males, but not all males. But I did read an article at, like, NPR that said, like, the majority of males, when they do read, um, and they read less than women anyway. They read more nonfiction than fiction. So for me, the only fiction I really read um, was fantasy. So I don't really remember going to like the YA section per se just to be there. Uh, I'm not sure if fantasy in my Barnes and Noble was actually shelved in like YA fantasy was shelved in fantasy or like in the separate like YA fantasy section like back then mm-hmm. because this yeah, was no, like the actually- 90s. I think I honestly think when we were teenagers, YA fantasy was not really a thing um, as a genre itself. I'm trying to remember. I know like the Artemis Fowl books. Were oh popular. gosh, yeah. I gotta bold up that Kenneth Branagh's gonna make that movie. It's gonna be so good. And and like so, the Animorphs and like whatever. Yes, yes. But, <laughs> yeah. but they weren't they weren't marketed. I don't think as fantasy necessarily or even yeah. i don't know young adult like i'm no, trying to market that was still children's, children's. i think yeah. that was still when like everything yeah. was children's i think you know, I, I do remember i do remember going to the children's section when i got like narnia and Pydrain, yeah. um and probably harry potter but after that like my trajectory was like once i read those i moved up to the lord of the rings and yeah. that was like in the adult fantasy section. So I never really went back to the children's like section of bookstores after I was like 11. Mm-hmm. So I was the opposite. I spent like a large, like after I should have grown out of it, probably I like, for long, like even now, like the rest of the bookstore, I find intimidating because <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to read a mystery. I don't know if I want to read a fantasy. I don't want to spend hours walking around looking at all the sections. That's it. I don't so, know the like, problem. Like I, I know that the only fiction I ever want to read is like fantasy or, or the classics uh, once in a while. So, like, I'm in and out, like, in one section. And then I'm, I'm Yeah, happy. so for me, like, that one section was the YA for the longest time. Like, now I read everything because it's not the same. But, like, yeah. when I used to go to the bookstore and the library, I would make a beeline for YA, and I would look at all the covers, judge a book by its cover literally, and then come home with something. Yeah, so, and I really think that the YA, especially when we were growing up, I think now maybe it has expanded a little bit. Um, but... Sarah, I totally agree with you because I'm thinking the YA books that I was exposed to when I was actually a teenager were like your Sarah Dessen. Yes, um, yes. Oh my and, God. And, you know, Dessen. your other, like, I'm a modern exactly right. teenager oh. in high school falling in love sort of books. And usually there was a, a plot other than that and something, you know, like someone's parent had died or someone was dealing yeah. with something in their life or you even had there was that series of books that was about self-harm. Um, oh, the books by Ellen Hopkins. Yeah. Um, but that was like YA. To, I'm like, 
I'm actually thinking about my trajectory as a reader, and I know I went from the children's section, which is we where your like Artemis Fowl and Harry Potter and Golden Compass and all of that was housed, and then I went straight to adult fantasy, and only recently, like maybe when I was in college, actually discovered like YA fantasy and like <laughs> YA. I know I went through a phase in high school where I was reading all of the Sarah Dustin and whatever, but that was what YA was, I think. Yeah, I don't think I really read that much fantasy in high school. In middle school, I was reading, like, Tamora Pierce and so on, but that was definitely in the YA section of my bookstore. Yeah. And, but I was borrowing it from friends. No, yeah. Tamora Pierce was definitely in the adult fantasy section. Not in my, definitely. In my library. Yeah, I've only ever seen her shelved in children's. Yeah, I mean, I can say my trajectory as a reader, yeah, I started in the children's section and then moved out into the adult because, honestly, I've always been sort of a read-everything-that-I-can-get-my-hands-on kind of person, but I was more interested in reading the classics and in reading and being basically a real snob and reading, like, Homer and Shakespeare and Austin, and I really went through all of that sort of, like, the canon, as you, if you will, and just sort of anything. And I didn't come back into young adult. I mean, really, I mean, I read Twilight in high school, but I, I didn't like beeline for that section. I just sort of got those books as they came out. And then it wasn't until, honestly, I picked up the Mortal Instruments series that I realized there was an entire section of a bookstore dedicated to books like that. And yep. I just went, what is this holy grail I have never known about? And then... Even then, in college, I pretty much only read the Cassandra Clare books. And then once I got out of university I and got onto BookTube again, I was sort of introduced to this wealth of literature I never even knew existed. But I feel like it's because it didn't. Yeah, it, it, not, it, I don't think it really did. Um, because it was know. either you, you had this weird divide between children's and adult. And there wasn't a really good in-between. Um, at least not in terms of dedicated a, a space to it in the bookstore. I don't recall it, at least, um, until... Yeah, I'm thinking now my memory actually might be kind of hazy, because now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, like, for the past, like, 10 years, 99% of what I've read has been given to me by someone or recommended to me by someone. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. while I remember standing in the YA section of the library very clearly, and I remember it being a lot of Sarah Dutton and so on, and I'm, I'm fairly sure Tamora Pierce was there, at least, like, the circle books... But now that I'm really thinking about it, though, those books were given to me by a friend. I didn't have my own copies. Mm -hmm. Like, And then later on, I went and got them from the library or so on. But when I first picked them up, it wasn't... Even now, like, all the books I read are, like, the books we read for book club or, like, the books my mom reads. Like, I don't... I haven't been to a bookstore and, like, picked up a book randomly since maybe, like, I read these books from the YA section called... Oh, shoot, what are they called? Started with an L. Lux. It's got this like. Oh my on. god! I Jeff love those Hill, books. Arm and Trout. I. But I. But I picked up those books because they had a beautiful red dress on the cover. I was like, wow, pretty dress. I'll read this. Like. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I'm. I'm wondering if my 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 memory is actually kind of wrong. I'm. I'm not sure. I remember the Lux series by Jennifer L. Arm and Trout. The first book was called Obsidian, but the Lux. Oh, yes. The Lux, yeah, they have girls in ball gowns on them. Yeah, there was about, it was about, 18, it was about New York at the turn of the century, and that's it was like yes, that's exactly. Was, now I know which series you're talking about. I really liked them, actually. Like they're kind of, but then that's the same thing. It's like historical fiction, but it's just the exact same like teen love drama, just packaged different. So I, I don't know. That's that's my image of YA. Not that I'm actually thinking about it, I guess. Your image of YA is teen as love it was, drama, just packaged as it was, ways. Yeah, as it was to I mean, yeah. I mean, though. even like Hunger Games, like that's that's teen love drama too. Oh. Like, <laughs> Sorry, I'm in the minority. I don't like those books. No, but I mean, like, I'm just saying, like. No, but I agree with you. <laughs> except for maybe, like, Harry Potter. That's true. This, I mean, book six kind of, kind of dealt with it, but it was like a side plot. Yeah, and but I don't know that Harry Potter I would consider YA in the definition that I think of in my head. I think of Harry Potter just as Harry Potter. Like, it is unto itself. We've just been talking about it a lot. <laughs> I came back to it. It's been unto itself. Yeah, I know Harry Potter is its own its own special thing. You need to go read Andrew Smith. He writes great YA with male protagonists. I'll just... It's hard to find. I, I mean, the majority of them do feature female protagonists. The males are usually side characters or love interests. There are some that feature male protagonists. I mean, you could look at the outsiders as a total is, classic. Is that, is that, is that really 
a thing in like YA? I didn't realize. It's predominantly yeah, female actually, protagonists without um, question. Okay, that was actually, I wondered why, cause you had mentioned that you don't really read YA and so you're more interested in like adult fantasy and I thought that might have been one of the reasons cause I know that's why my fiance Dave doesn't really read YA is because he doesn't mind female protagonists but he just connects more to male protagonists and it's, they're just hard to find in um. YA literature. I, I I don't really care what gender the protagonist is. I, I actually find it more interesting if there's a female protagonist because that's like a a view into something different. Okay. Mm-hmm. I wonder if like, like, like plenty. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean I think I think I think they're great female characters in like adult fantasy literature, but obviously um I think this is in one of the book club like a while ago or something. Sarah pointed out that like it's it's still like Always dependent on a male. Like, even if they're multiple characters and one of them is a female character, there's always like a, a main guy who's like male. Oh, it was when we were talking about, um, yeah. oh shoot, gosh, I'm totally, circle, wheel, wheel of time. That's uh, what we were talking about, I think. Yeah, maybe. But then, I mean, we were talking about how there's so many female casts, but the main character is still a dude, I think. But they're all still kind of dependent on Rand, who's a male. Yes, yeah, I'm saying, I think that's when we were talking about, I think that's when I said that. I think that's probably why so many young, girls especially gravitate towards YA because they're given these very proactive female protagonists who are sort of like, like, go away, I've got this. But I mean, the, my issue is then oftentimes they bring in that horrible love triangle trope, which shows oh up God, a I lot. It. When it doesn't show up, I get extremely pleased and I'll be like, yes, oh my gosh, thank you, it's not here. But the majority of YA does feature female protagonists and especially even in the YA dystopian and in the YA fantasy, um, the female protagonist, you're going to find more of them than you will the male protagonist. Um, yep. Not. Although I think as Shelley or Sarah was just bringing up, though, even when you have the female protagonist, and luckily, especially in dystopian, I think then she's also super capable and usually kind of a bad ass. Um, <coughs> ass. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, yeah, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> it happened. Um, then, But there's always a male protagonist, almost always, actually, I can think of like maybe one or two exceptions, who is just as important to the story mm-hmm. or is like better at other things. And so I don't know, I'm trying to think if there's a book, you know, young adult or adult out there where it's just like, hey, we're women and we're not dependent on men to tell our story. Tamora Pierce. <laughs> other than Tamora Pierce, yes. Okay, fair. I think I think a part of it might also be the setting. Um Yeah. As you know, like, as you noted, like, right, like, a lot of YA is, like, kind of dystopian or, like, it's in, like, non-medieval times. So it would it would be reasonable for a woman to, like, be a protagonist in that type of setting. But if it's, like, trying to, like, reflect a medieval error, it would not be oh, as, right. like, reasonable, you know? Like, mm-hmm. it, I mean, I guess if you're trying to be historically accurate about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the only one I can think of that was sort of like that, like, in a... Fan, kind of a traditional fantasy setting, for lack of a better term. They really had a strong female protagonist who kind of grows as her own. And yes, there's a male protagonist who's with her. But at the end of the day, she's like, I am woman. Hear me roar. Like, I got this. Is The Girl of Fire and Thorns by Ray Carson. That is a ridiculously, I mean, feminist trilogy where, yes, there is a male. And yes, he's important. But it's it's always about the main the main female and her journey and her growth. And how by the end, she's like, I can do this. I got it. And you're just like, yes, that's my baby. I've seen grow up for three books. You go, girl. <laughs> you take I wonder if it's because, like, the history of traditional fantasy, like a traditional adult fantasy, is more male-focused, I would f- say. Yeah. I mean, I don't really know it that well, but I mean, maybe that's if- why. Whereas, yeah. like, YA comes from more, like we were talking about before, like, um, like love female. story, kind of, like, yeah. female writers. Like, I think the history of it is different. Yeah. And that's why the trajectory has been different. But it's definitely overlapping and changing as we've been talking about this whole time. So yeah, it's for example, like I wonder we were talking about Brandon Sanderson earlier, mm-hmm. and I I think something that sets his books apart from his adult fantasy, right? But I think something that sets his books apart from other adult fantasy that's popular right now is how like yeah, it's violent, yeah, it's like got it's like serious points, but like he's pretty low key about like sexual violence, mm-hmm. for example. 
Um, and I think that might have something to do with his religion. I'm not entirely yeah, sure. It's, it does. it's really not important. <laughs> but, um, it does. but because of that, I would expect that it would be, because it's not so like gritty, I guess, I would have expected that it would be classified as YA and it's obviously not. Yeah, and I have to wonder if that has something to do with I don't know if it's his writing history. I don't know if it's because he's male or I, I, I'm not sure. But if I were to guess, there's a couple things to it. Like he does have some YA series. Um, Miss Bourne kind of gets shelved in both. He's got the, the Reckoner series and the Rhythmatist series are sell, sold strictly in young adult. Um, and he's even got middle grade with Alcatraz and the librarians. But his adult fantasy, I mean, when I think of, like, The Way of Kings and... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that I go, I don't think you could ever shelve that in young adult. There's something really? about... There's something about the writing and the pacing of the writing that I just go, I don't know if you could market that to a young adult. I mean, you could, not deliberately from a publisher, like, you could word of mouth it to a young adult, but... I don't know if a publisher would want to market that towards. So that's what I'm curious about, though. I want to know, like, what? Yeah. I would, why do we feel that way? You I want to read that book. They want to tie it to the fact that he finished the Wheel of Time series. So it's like, oh, it's oh, so that's epic why. fantasy from him. Let's put that in adult because these are the people who've been reading the Wheel of Time series. So that makes sense. And that's that's my guess. Uh, does any does everyone have some closing thoughts they want to? Do we feel like we talked about what we wanted to talk about? Well, here, here's one, one possible, like, I guess idea for, like, a last topic is it seems to me that, like, YA fantasy is a lot, like, more popular than just, like, normal, like, YA, like, story about a high school thing. Like, is that, is that, would you yeah, say I think totally that right. that's the market trend right now, definitely, that, yeah. like, dystopian and fantasy are much bigger than your high, I'm a high school or doing something high schooly. Yeah, and even then the dystopian starting to bow to the fantasy. Um, you see much more of the I, white. I, I mean, I wonder why that's the case. Uh, I think it's, it's a market trend. trend. It wasn't true. Like, I mean, it's a new, I mean, it changes like every couple of years, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it is. I think they can sell it, so. You, you don't think it's like something deeper? Like kids, no, it's, kids are looking for something. It's, it's not. I remember listening to a panel of publishers and they're like, this happens all the time. It's really yeah. not that unusual. I mean, even in the last, like, 10, I mean, I guess it's a little more than 10 years since Twilight, but let's, like, use Twilight as the beginning of the market. Then we had Paranormal Romance. You had Paranormal Romance, which was, like, literally every book that you found in the YA section. Would. Still, to an extent, it's tapering off, but it was that. And then you moved into dystopian, okay. and now and then to- fantasy was born. So now you still have a lot of paranormal romance, and you still have a lot of dystopian, but clearly fantasy is dominant, and so... We can assume that will cycle out and something else will come in at some yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> well, I mean, it'll always be there, but yeah. something else will become the market trend, per se. Because, I mean, for the longest time with the paranormal romance, you had Twilight, the Hush Hush Saga, the Fallen series, the Vampire Diaries and Vampire Academy and everything that's come out of that. And then it's came... Really and books. then you can't yeah. even name everything in that. Like, it's just yeah. absurd, the volume of books. Yeah, and it's the same with the dystopian. You have Hunger Games, Divergent, The Maze Runner, and literally everything that's a copy of that that has come out in the wake of that. And then now we've moved into the fantasy. But the one thing I do appreciate that I see in the fantasy is that every fantasy has been relatively different. And yeah, that's not just one, copies of the same thing. Yeah, because I don't yeah, think Yeah, because really they have high to- fantasy and urban fantasy and there's a bunch of different kinds of things going on with the YA fantasy. They're more interesting stories, I think. Yeah. For- so I wonder if that means the trend will last longer because there's more to work with. I think it yeah. will. And then also because they're like, you can get away with like really long series. I think yeah. it will. I mean, like Throne of Glass will be six books and like most things God. will go beyond a trilogy. Um, So I think that'll be interesting. I mean, even things like Shadowhunter Chronicles is an urban fantasy and that's been going for like, you know, nine books. No. Yeah. And it's still got like three more series that'll come out so you can just get away with it for longer (laughs) so i guess our final conclusion is like maybe there's something but it's up to the publisher (laughs) (laughs) and we will buy it yeah they can decide it for me i'll buy it but i don't want to decide it (laughs) i know it when i see it Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I've got to go, but if you can talk with us, fine. Um, I'll catch up with you later. But it was great talking to you guys. Yes, yeah, Sarah, uh, thank you so have, much for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you. I'm really glad I could. Yay. Yay, <laughs> Yay Saturday morning. <laughs> so.
Okay, yeah. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye bye. Okay, bye. bye. See you, listeners, if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, so I think we can probably wrap up too. Yeah, I think we probably could because I'm starting to yawn and fall asleep. Yeah, <laughs> I'm starting to fade over here. Grandma. Yeah, I do too. I have to go work out. I don't have to get up early, but I'm a grandma and this is like three hours past my bedtime, so. Yeah. I, Sleepy. I guess I'm the only person who sleeps at like three. Yeah, I can't do that anymore. Do you? See, I have an eight to five job now and I had grandma tendencies before and now they're like magnified significantly. <laughs> hmm. I mean, so, I think we could just say in closing that there's a lot about the YA genre that we feel is sort of undefined, but it certainly is something, although it is also affected by marketing. I think those were like the three main topics you can pull out of that. I don't know if you guys have yeah. anything to add to that or. I, I feel like we didn't get too deep into like who ends up reading it. Like we touched upon this a bit, but like the majority of people who read YA, like, we established that fifty five percent of them are adults, but I still suspect they're like that's mostly a female audience. And yeah, yeah, and that statistic comes from people who are purchasing YA, not necessarily reading. That's what that statistic was. They say, I mean, you could argue that factors into that's adults buying same. gifts for yeah. children. So there's really no. I haven't yeah. found one definitive study. I think it's just sort of generally accepted from the various studies that have been done that it is predominantly females, um, but that there's really no a specific age range. It's anyone from the ages of 12 up through like, you know, 65. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it, I think that's part of the, the, some of the statistics that they haven't really nailed down because th- there's something about the genre that is so fluid um, in terms of who reads it. Yeah. That's I actually I like really sleep. have to go to sleep. I'm like dying. I need to sleep. Like I'm 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 losing it as we can probably tell. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm signing off. Girl number two is out too. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes. Or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. See you next time!